Hello everybody, how are you going? Welcome to some Canada vignettes, starting out with Voyages. Like most things about canoes, portage is an Indian invention with a French name. From porte to carry, to avoid rapids, or worse. A Great Lakes canoe carried three tons of freight. Goods north for fur south at 1,600 kilometers a month. 11 meters in length, a birch freight canoe weighed 275 kilograms and rode tenderly on the shoulders of four voyageurs. Romantic in legend, the real man staggered under packs which weighed more than he did. <laughs> Chilled and bitten, ruptured by their loads or drowned by rapids, many a voyageur lies buried on the trail he opened west. But their roots became our roads, and their endurance and pluck, our heritage. Well, as we know, there are some seriously just very intricate stories as part of all of this, and this is exactly why we watch them, just to gain so much insight, even just the almost specs, if you want to call them that, the 275 kilo canoe that four guys were carrying in. So they're carrying like 80 kilos each or 75 kilos each over these kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. Like, you, no wonder they were just collapsing under packs of their own weight, for goodness sake. I mean, you know, your legs would just be burning if nothing else. My God, they are very, very impressive. To be honest though, that doesn't sound half bad at all, considering the fact that it could take three tons of freight, and I believe he said goods north and fur south, and so that definitely describes the kind of era that they are living in, but three tons, for goodness sake, and a, let's just call it 300 kilo canoe, carrying 10 tons of weight, I mean, I guess it was 10 meter by probably like close to one meter, and I guess then by 0.3 of a meter, if it has a capacity of three tons, but regardless, to be having that all wrapped up in a 300 kilo package that you can carry around across the Great Lakes, where historically i always thought that they were just perfectly flat you know any lake i've ever come across virtually has no turbulence in the water but everyone's told me otherwise that they can actually get decent storms waves everything in between and then even just listening to this south, again listen to at the 1600 corners. kilometers a month 1600 kilometers a month i mean that's just outrageous and let's just call it 50 kilometers per day i mean i don't know if that's them walking or if that's them rowing or if that's a combination of both but regardless to be traveling 50 kilometers a day in maybe what 10 to 12 hours in a day less than that in the winter for sure because you just don't have the light and you also don't have the well the liquid water for that but man, to be traveling five kilometers an hour, I guess then even that is darn impressive with three tons if you're rowing that along. Man, these guys are insane and I guess it certainly opens up a massive book as to what to explore next. In 1731, the Hudson's Bay Company began construction of Fort Prince of Wales at the mouth of the Churchill River on Hudson Bay. 25 feet will do, Mr. Ross. No, Governor, 42 The meddling governor insisted that the walls be built narrower than called for in the plans. Fire! Unfortunately, the governor had neglected to consider the recoil of the cannons, and the walls had to be rebuilt. Oh, no. Oh, no. Fort Prince of Wales took almost 40 years to complete and saw action only once. In August 1782, French Admiral La Perouse sailed into Hudson Bay, much to the dismay of the fort's governor, Samuel Hearn. What? With three ships and 400 men at his command, La Perouse demanded the surrender of the fort. With only 39 men, Hearn surrendered without firing a single shot. The French left after unsuccessfully trying to destroy the fort. What unsuccessfully? I mean, I guess when you were just going to be building it to the original specifications, going 42 bricks, was it? I, I just I missed it. Wait, I think he just said 25 feet. feet will do, Mr. Rock. No, Governor, four. Yeah, 25 feet, no, 42 feet. Jeez, 42 feet thick walls. I mean, obviously, the 25 wasn't enough, but 25 feet, that's that's almost 10 meters. No, it'd be like eight meters, seven meters, if you want to be a little bit generous. So seven meters thick, and that was nowhere near enough. You needed 42, all the way up to 13 meters thick walls, just to take into consideration the fact that the cannon recoil would send it off the back edge. And I mean, you certainly wouldn't want to be standing there, that the poor guy. The neglected to consider Look, the recoil of the cannons. That is outrageous. Neglected to consider the recoil of the cannons. 
Meanwhile, it virtually never got used and so the entire thing was a pointless exercise. I just cannot believe that it took almost 40 years to build and these poor guys were dropping blocks on their toes for 40 years. I mean, these guys are absolutely outrageously strong to be carrying around, let's just call it 800 millimeter cubic blocks of pure granite, I, I can only presume. Oh man, I definitely do not want to be them and if nothing else, it definitely puts also the voyagers to shame with the packs as heavy as them. No, these blocks are 10 times as heavy as a human. And look, I guess it does make sense to be in a bit of a torn mindset between, okay, they have 400 people, but we have a fort. So which one do we want? And especially then to realize that they could not destroy it or they attempted to destroy it. Oh, it's weird. I feel as though you would go in there and try and claim it and use it instead of just trying to destroy it because it's clearly a very well-made resource. And I would have thought that if you could hold on to that, then that would make more sense than just going in there destroying it and leaving. I do now need to know exactly where this is in terms of, okay, it's the, yeah, oh wow, that is, okay, fair enough, let me just look at this in terms of what it really looks like, is it still hanging around or is it just ruins? Wow, it's hard to tell exactly, is there any real photos? Yeah, so you go, let's just look at some real photos of this in the modern era to try and see these 42 feet thick walls because I wonder if that's what it ended up being built as in its 40 year crusade. I mean looking around the fact that they only had 36 guys living in this entire thing is pretty ridiculous. I mean look you got the cannons, you got the walls, that probably, oh it's a bit hard to tell exactly how wide that is but regardless the amount of stone being lugged around and dug out, oh man these poor fellas, all 36 of them like I was saying they were living in this mansion of a place. Oh and to be fair it's not even like the ships can just pull up at your front door, I mean it would be a bit of a shot to shoot all the way from down there all the way up to here you'd kind of have to do an assault from the ground because it's well it's up for one where they get to shoot down upon you and so I felt as though they should have given it a try if nothing else even 36 of them probably could have hailed them out for a little while however I just listened to it again and I went hang on a second I feel as though I recognize that name and I'm wanting to listen Action to it again to once. get a name in August 1782 well. French Admiral La Perouse sailed into Hudson. French Admiral in 1882, La Perouse, that is just a name that makes sense in Australian terms as well. Now look, I'm not entirely sure if it's the same guy and I'm also not entirely sure how common of a last name or a name this is, but the coincidences definitely do lined up that you have a French naval officer that was set on a voyage around the world, born in 1741, so everything lines up there. And then if I come up here, La Perouse's ships arrived off the coast in 1788, but were unable to enter Botany Bay until the 26th of January. So if he is just cruising around the world, obviously highly skilled navigator and all those different things, there is plenty of time between 1782 and 1788 to go from the Hudson Bay to Botany Bay. A thousand years ago, if you saw one of these coming, you got out of the way. Longboats full of wolves, they were called, rigged in leather, side ruddered and at ease in a menacing sea, their oak planks flexed to the twist of the waves. With 30 men, this gorgeous rowboat could cross the Atlantic in 28 days and survive just about anything. This may have had something to do with the crews, who seemed to relish the most distasteful conditions. <laughs> Ridiculous. Leif Erikson here, an archetypal Norseman, was quite prepared to conquer a new world as soon as he found it. Right. In a spruce cove in Newfoundland, this blend of aggression and technology reached America 500 years before Columbus. Now look, this is certainly not the first time that I've come across the story of these guys just making these ridiculous travels, like you said, 28 days across the Atlantic in what seems to be any conditions. Like they said, they relished in the foul conditions of the North Atlantic. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, yeah, you've got leather, but that's it, leather and fur, I guess they are just built for these environments to a degree, they just know what they're getting into and they just love the adventure and everything that comes with it, they love the challenge of beating, so to say, whatever the weather throws at them. But exactly as he said at the end there, it's not just some profound luck or even some genetic mutation that allows them to not just feel the cold, no, the application of knowledge and science and technology into their boat building and navigation and everything in that regard is just, well, 
for its era, second to none. It was just amazing what these people were able to do. Like they said, they just went out and just went for another land. He assumed it was out there and he was ready to conquer it as soon as he could. And to me, I think one of the most amazing things about these guys is the fact that this story is not a solo story. It happened all over the world or at least all over Europe. Just these explorers just going out there finding Greenland, Canada, all these different places that people then discovered later on. Meanwhile, there was obviously also an indigenous population living there that have either traveled via foot or boat as well. And so there are so many different things that are in there, but no, it's always the Christopher Columbus and the this and the that that, that is true discoverers. But there were so many precedences set before them, especially just given the time period. That is the thing that I can never get out of my mind. The fact that this was 500 years before, what, the 1600s? Is that when Christopher Columbo was over? So you're looking at a thousand years ago, these guys were just sailing across the Atlantic and probably all over the world as well, just willy-nilly. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, I didn't know, and I'm sure plenty of people do, but 1492 and then 500 years before that, the kind of knowledge that they had just locked in their society with boat building and navigation is outrageous for the time a thousand years ago it's it's so ridiculous Anna Jameson the pioneer poetess was into plants the pity I have for the trees in Canada how do we know trees don't feel their downfall we know nothing about it what? a Canadian settler hates a tree regards it as his natural enemy, as something to be destroyed, eradicated, annihilated by all and any means. Why? A recent visitor complained that in Canada, there's too much of everything, too much rock, too much snow, and above all, too much forest. Not quite, said naturalist J.D. Robbins. I can approach trees with joy and pleasure but I approach a man with caution. When man has attained the trustworthiness of the tree, he may be allowed its freedom. Interesting. I wonder if that entire thing is written mixed in with the poetry is what it sounded like, but it's definitely an interesting and very nice message just going, okay, well, apparently there is too much of everything in Canada, so we have to eradicate it. So what does that even mean? What are you left with? If you eradicate everything down to what? If you get rid of the rock, for goodness sake, you were left with nothing. And so this land that you want to be living on and working from and gaining things from will be reduced to nothing. And so you'll have nothing left. It, it, it seems like a backwards mentality of sorts. Look, I could understand that, especially in those kind of times if you were going we need to get rid of the trees in terms of using the trees and foresting the trees so we can build this and build boats and build houses and everything like that but to just clear it for clearing sake that doesn't make any sense to me i mean maybe it's very british in terms of you've only got so much room in britain and it's been cleared for farmland for pff, forever for goodness sake i mean it's been rolling green hills forever and then you come over here and there's too much of everything and of course there is you'd be overwhelmed by all the forest you can't just go out and have pastures no because you've got trees in the way and i guess that's maybe where the thinking is coming from but like they were saying, to be approached by a tree or to be approached by a man and does not have the kind of trust, the tree just doesn't run away from you, it doesn't expect to be chopped down or anything like that, it just sits there and waits and does its thing all year round, whether it's leaves are falling off or the snow is falling upon it or whatever it may be, it just sits there and it just hangs out and there is nothing else to it. It's not like every single other person is going to be complaining, oh, it's snowing too much, oh, it's too hot, oh, it's too windy, oh, it's too cold, it's too this, it's whatever it is. No, the tree just sits there loving life regardless. So even though the these beautiful little videos originally came out in 1978. I think a lot of what they stand for and a lot of what they teach us can still be carried forth into today, you know, whether that be from historical figures and the stories they carried to the people and the physical canoes and rocks and goods that they carried all the way down to the trees. I mean, even just look at what Canada is going through at the moment, the trees need to be respected and we can see that through so many different means. Does, what, if they're not, then we just turn into the people in these stories just eradicating everything down to the rocks and like they said, then we're left with nothing. Thing.